Moderator. Well, good morning, folks. Appreciate very much you being here. As you can see, first of all, by Admiral Gortney's remarks this morning, what a great scene setter that he gave everybody. And you take a look at how he laid it out and then built on the conference. You can see each one of the pieces of the conference and how it links together for his vision as he looks at this from the command of Fleet Forces Command. And we know again, as he said, joint and coalition, and you will certainly see a joint panel before you right now. And a very, very important one is the first one to start the day. As you uh, have your troopers, and everybody's a trooper regardless of which of the five services or coalition you're in, uh, just remember continuing education units, as Terry, our golden throat, said a few moments ago, very important. Take advantage of our industry partner interface, very, very key, and you'll hear this again as we wrap up this panel. We, you already heard the title of the panel, and you're going to be in for quite a treat this morning. The narrator uh, <clears throat> ind indicated the name of the panel and what it's going to be discussing, but I have the privilege of introducing your moderator, Lieutenant General Bill Rue, United States Air Force. Again, under the concept that my wife uses with me, the three Bs, be brief, baby, that was a message I got from General Rue, a 1979 graduate of the Air Force Academy, broad background, F-16 pilot, including operations at the Southern Watch and Enduring Freedom. During the initial major combat operations phase of Operation Iraqi Freedom, he was the Director of Combined Air Ops Center at Prince Sultan Air Force Base in Saudi Arabia. He's commanded at virtually every level in which you can command. He's a great Air Force pilot, and he himself uh, now as a Vice Commander of Air Combat Command, a great leader, a great person, uh, and I'd ask you to please Give him a warm round of applause for the Naval Institute and AFSIA International for our opening panel. General Rue. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for those kind remarks, General Divya. I'm happy to be back at the Joint Warfighting Symposium. This is my uh, fourth time to this uh, event, this venue, and it's, uh, everyone has been very, very uh, intellectually stimulating and rewarding. I knew, that, I knew how to get here because it is my fourth time, but my exec didn't. So he put the directions for this convention center into his, uh, his phone for his GPS to find his way here. And maybe some of you all did the same thing. And if you didn't, if you already knew, maybe you flew in here. I can guarantee that the pilot on your aircraft was probably using GPS to navigate. You're probably using some advanced radio systems, maybe even perhaps SATCOM to talk back to the home base of Delta, United, or whatever you came in on. And perhaps as you were flying here, the aircraft may have used his own onboard radar to avoid some thunderstorm. All of that technology, all of us take for granted today. And so do our soldiers, our sailors, and our airmen that have been fighting in conflict for the last 10 years. So what would your journey have been like trying to come here to this venue if there had been someone trying to deny you the use of that technology, to deny you the ability to know where you are, to navigate, to deny that pilot the ability to talk to the controllers or to avoid the weather. Or perhaps even worse, if there had been some adversary who was able to, from a cyber perspective, get into your laptop and mess with your reservations to come out here. How would that have affected your simple ability to come to this venue? That sets the stage for the, for the theme for this panel, is how do we command and control our forces in a contested environment? For the last decade, we're all very well aware that we've been in a particular kind of a conflict, an irregular warfare, counterinsurgency kind of a conflict for the last 10 years. It has been a relatively permissive environment for the air domain and the maritime domain, relatively, relatively permissive, permissive, particularly in the command and control arena. For the ground domain, it has not been a permissive environment. It's been a contested environment, but along a, a certain slice of the range of military operations and counterinsurgency warfare. Command and controlling those components, air, ground, and maritime, and even special ops, we've enjoyed a certain access to this technology I was talking about. 
We've enjoyed fairly good communications. The enemy necessarily hasn't been hindering our ability to communicate, but perhaps we're limited maybe by geography, mountains, and infrastructure, but not the enemy. The enemy we've been fighting for the last decade has not been taking away our GPS signals, messing with the data that we use for situational awareness. It's still a very, very tough problem. But the focus of this panel this morning is on how do we fight in a differently contested, a more highly contested environment? How do we command and control our forces? The future conflicts, this challenge to the information, this challenge to the electromagnetic spectrum, this challenge to the RU cyber, and the challenge to how we move our forces with long range and very accurate tactical ballistic missiles will change the equation of our war fighting. And we have to be able to execute and fight and win against that challenge, not just at the tactical level, but at the operational level. All those things that we've come to rely on, all those things that many of our young warriors come to expect, communication, navigation, data link, radar, awareness, use of cyber, all of those things our, our warriors have come to expect. And in a future conflict, a determined adversary will attempt to take some of that away, will attempt to deceive us, will attempt to degrade it. Will we be ready? And what will we do about it? So that's the focus of this panel. And we have some very distinguished members of the panel that are going to give you their opinion from a personal perspective, from their service perspective, and from a joint perspective. They have very, very rich and different backgrounds. I'd like to go over that real quickly with you. Starting on my far right, Rear Admiral Dave Thomas is presently the commander of Naval Surf Force Atlantic. He's a 1981 graduate of the Naval Academy. And he's got more of 30 years experience leading maritime forces as a surface warfare officer, serving on guided missile frigates and cruisers, amphibious ships, as well as commanding the guided destroyer USS Ross and destroyer Squadron 26. Most recently, they've commanded Carrier Stripe Group, which is humanitarian and relief operations supporting Joint Task Force Haiti in 2010. Dave brings a proven perspective of the myriad of C2 challenges facing our nation's maritime force. To his left, Brigadier General Jim Rainey is presently the director of the Mission Command Center of Excellence at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Since receiving his commission at ROTC at Eastern Kentucky University in 1987, Jim has had an early and very strong background as an infantry officer, starting as a platoon leader with the 82nd Airborne Division and the 75th Ranger Regiment, a company commander with the 3rd U.S. Infantry, the Old Guard, and he has very extensive combat experience, multiple tours uh, in Iraq. Operation Iraqi Freedom, as in the major combat ops when we went into Iraq in the first time, and then continuing on in, as a battalion commander in the Battle of Fallujah in OIF-1, and culminating as a heavy brigade combat team commander in OIF-2. Jim has served on the Joint Staff and also the UCOM staff, and was recently a US, U.S. Army Fellow at the Corbell School of International Relations at Denver University, where I think Secretary Condoleezza Rice was one of your classmates, so at that level of fellow. Jim brings a wealth of operational and tactical C2 experience from the ground component commander's perspective. To his left, Rear Admiral Mark Hanley is presently the Deputy Commander, Naval Expeditionary Combat Command. Since his commissioning through Navy ROTC at Villanova in 1981, Mark has vast experience leaving, leading Navy construction battalions and facilities engineering functions across the Navy. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, Mark deployed with the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force to Fallujah, Iraq, and most recently he served as the Deputy Commander for Navy Installations Command. Mark is uniquely qualified to give the perspective of C2 challenges facing logistics and distributed operations at sea in the littorals and onshore. And finally, to my right, Air Force Brigadier General Rob Givens is presently that works in the Director of Plans, Programs, and Requirements at Air Combat Command. He's a 1986 graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, and Rob has served in a variety of operational assignments flying the F-16 and the A-10, including combat missions and operations Desert Storm, Southern Watch, and Iraqi Freedom. As well, he 
commanded the 8th Fighter Wing at Kunsan Air Base in Korea. And most recently, he led the Joint and Co Coalition Air Operations in Southwest Asia as the director of the Combined Air Operations and Space Operations Center for Air Force's Central Command. Rob's recent operational C2 experience as the KAOC director has been valuable to the Air Force as we look in the Air Force to shift our culture of our airmen and the joint partners to understanding the critical need to train for these contested environments. So that's your panel today, different service components, a logistics basing component, and we're going to get into the questions. So up front, we're going to start off at the tactical level. This is pretty simple military stuff. We're going to start at the tactical level, we're going to talk about the operational level, and then what the services are doing about how to prepare to fight in this contested environment. So in this contested environment, like I've been describing, gentlemen, the impact at the tactical level, what does that, what does that pretend for your service or for your function? Now, Jim, I'm going to start with you because, well, because you were looking at me. That's your mistake. <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> but actually, Jim, because of his combat experience, of, of the actual the major combat ops of going into Iraq, uh, that was a pretty intense combat operations, and then your subsequent tours back there where you saw it change, and now we're looking at a, a different future of, of contested operations and perhaps uh, some of the things that I've mentioned here this morning. How do you view your challenge for that for the Army and what you're seeing out at Leavenworth? Oh, thank you, sir. And good morning, everybody. Um, for the land forces, and I, I think the Marines, if they were on the panel, would agree. And we work very closely with them and also the Special Operations Forces. So when I talk about the land forces, I'm really being inclusive and talking about all three. So in the last 12 years, we've had uh, very decentralized operations, uh, combat outposts, platoons, squad level fights, decentralized operations. We've had some limited uh, high-end periods of combat, uh, Fallujah, the original uh, invasion of Iraq, Tora Bora, Battle of Baghdad, some examples, but when they were high-end, we were able to centralize and mass the joint force for those periods of time. So the future tactical scenarios we see are the worst of both of those. We're going to be forced to decentralize and operate in a decentralized manner, but it's going to be towards the higher end of conflict. So violent encounters decentralized, which will present a new challenge. We've done both before well, but not a whole lot of overlap. Um, we're going to fight amongst people, and we're going to fight in very complex terrain, whether it's urban sprawl or subterranean environments. Uh, you can run class, but you can think of the kind of places where we're going to fight underground as a land force, uh, which we've not done a lot in the past. We're going to be fighting at the very end of very long lines of communication that are going to be contested. And finally, we're going to be in an information environment that is going to be exceedingly complex. It's complex now, but it's going to get more complex as our enemies challenge us in that information environment, not just with the media, social media, but also in cyber. And it's going to present those kind of tactical challenges, which is why things like Mission Command which we'll talk about a little bit later, but in intent, commander's intent, mission orders, things we've always done that are going to enable our subordinate junior leaders to fight in a decentralized manner effectively in the future. And I think that's the tactical challenge that we're going to face, sir. Thank you, Jim. Admiral Thomas, from a, from a maritime domain, you have some thoughts at the tactical level. Thank you, sir. Key tenets of, uh, of maritime operations include knowing with necessary precision where you are and knowing with necessary precision what time it is. Those, those things have not changed in, uh, in centuries, uh, perhaps forever. Um, you need to know where you are so you don't hit something. Uh, you need to know what time it is so you can find out where your position is. Uh, and those, those are enduring truths. So fast forward day, today. Uh, almost exclusively for day-to-day -day operations on satellites to tell us what time it is and where we are on the face of the planet. And that is, that's a wonderful technology uh, leap, um, and it's, it's been very helpful. In a benign environment, we rely on that almost exclusively. I think we can, we can say with, with fair certainty that 
that that would be one of the first um, vulnerabilities that might be exploited in time of conflict in, a, in an anti-access uh, or anti-C2 environment. That would be a, that would be a vulnerability. So uh, one of the one of the key uh, focus points for for my service is how do we how do we assure ourselves of the of the access to information that tells us where we are, uh, the ability to determine our position, to determine to tell at what time it is, because in fact uh, everything from the ship's quartermaster to our, our weapon systems rely more and more on precision uh, of, of location and precision of timing, the synchronizing of all of our activities, including our weapon systems uh, and the guidance systems rely on those things. Uh, so that's not news, but it is uh, a capability that perhaps is a vulnerability as well. Uh, to the land or sea battle, uh, our centralized thinking and, and, and decision making and then commander's intent to the war fighting commanders being delivered, mission orders, uh, decentralized execution uh, is another fundamental strength of our, of our military, whether land force or maritime force or a joint or coalition force. That strength, again, uh, over the past several decades, and specifically in the last decade, we've had the luxury of a generally uncontested access to the communications paths uh, that gave us those, uh, those commanders' intent. Uh, and perhaps we've been a little less decentralized than, uh, than, we've, than we've had to be in decades past. So uh, recognizing those uh, realities uh, and the other reality that uh, those are perhaps vulnerabilities, uh, focusing on our training and our, our procurement uh, to, to be assured that when we need information, we can get it, and when we need to know commander's intent, uh, we can get it, and again, when we need to know with precision where we are and what time it is, we can have access to it. Those are th the key things that we're focused on in the maritime domain. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Givens, or Admiral Givens, I just changed your service. There's so much Navy here. So. <laughs> General Givens, uh, the Admiral talked about the, the uh, Navy relying on navigation and timing. I know in the Air Force we do the same thing. Would you talk about this uh, challenge of the contested environment from, a, from an air perspective, please? Uh, thank you, General, and good morning. Uh, the Air Force certainly faces some of those same issues uh, as far as the position keeping we have relied for the past decade on tactical data link to help us uh, be aware within our formations and also between formations and to rely on that type of uh, situational awareness to enhance our combat power. All of these things will be affected uh, if we lose those links in a degraded environment. Probably central though to the Air Force uh, tactically is going to be the uh, potential loss of precision with respect to satellite guided weapons and what that will mean. Loss of precision does not mean necessarily loss of effectiveness, but what it does mean is loss of the ability to control collateral damage tactically in the same way that we do today. Uh, we've dropped bombs for many years and we will continue to drop bombs when the satellites go away in a contested environment, but the issue of how we get those bombs to the target will become what's so significant. Another point that was brought up that I, I certainly don't want to uh, underestimate or diminish in any way, and we take it for granted, and we're discussing it on the way here this morning, but the issue of timing and the ability to keep time and all of the things that it goes into. Uh, anecdotally, in a fighter squadron, we used to give time hacks at the beginning of a briefing, uh, and now that's pretty much not done because people rely on the GPS in the aircraft once you get a good satellite signal. Uh, while that skill set still remains, it is indicative of a bigger problem when we start thinking about how timing impacts secure codes on radios, or the ability to talk to weapons, or the ability to talk to command and control, the ability to work with allies and things that all get synchronized by time, not the least of which is in the air arena, you know, being off by 30 seconds matters. Uh, being off by less than that actually matters. Uh, and if guys aren't operating off of the same time reference, then that could pose problems in, uh, tactically in certain types of strike missions. So tactically, all of these things put together really are going to impact the way in which our aircraft of any sort, whether it's a tanker rejoining with uh, long-range strike assets or whether it's the uh, 
fighters uh, doing air defense or sweeping in are going to have an impact on the way in which they fight. Thanks, Ron. Admiral Hanley, uh, we've talked uh, uh, kind of about the, the war fighting side of this. You have experience in establishing expeditionary bases over in, in AOR, and, and all of the services operate from and, and, and work from an expeditionary base and structure. We've been doing that in this Southwest Asia environment as we look to a more contested environment. What concerns you at the tactical level, given your background? Sir, sir thank you very much, and uh, um, pleasure to be here. I, I, I feel the need. I need to probably lend my Timex watch to the gentleman at the end who relies on time in case his satellites go out. But, uh, um, but as with all military functions, we all rely on, a, to a greater degree, uh, the, the uh, information that we get through the uh, through the cyber domain and SATCOMs being more and more dependent. <clears throat> um, but just to kind of give you a sense where uh, Admiral Thomas and I are, Admiral Thomas uh, talks from a uh, blue water maritime uh, uh, domain perspective, uh, and I have uh, the pr privilege of working with the Navy Expeditionary Forces, which uh, complement his amphibious forces uh, and really help connect the, the battle space from the sea to the shore. And so for those of you who aren't that familiar with it, those are the uh, maritime security forces, the small boats that uh, protect our harbors, uh, patrol our rivers uh, in a contested environment. Uh, and then explosive ordnance disposal, uh, you know, obviously a key role in clearing our ports, uh, as well as once they go ashore uh, in ensuring that we have uh, freedom of movement. Uh, and then also uh, expeditionary construction, Navy Seabees that uh, build those facilities that you talk about. Uh, and we've had that, uh, we've been doing that uh, for the last 10 years uh, in a contested, uh, you know, phase three environment. Uh, and so I think the challenges that we're going to have in, in that area as we, as all of our forces that go ashore, uh, our expeditionary logisticians uh, are always going to have uh, a need for a footprint ashore. And so as we go into that contested environment, uh, two things that I think are going to be important for us. Uh, one is the, uh, the ability to command and control our uh, units that are going to be, as we know, distributed. Uh, we often will build uh, small forward operating bases uh, throughout a battle space, uh, and that's going to be distributed. So the command and control amongst those uh, is going to be a critical for us. And in a, in a contested environment, I think we're going to go through the hierarchy of uh, satellite communications and complete network connectivity uh, back to uh, our traditional... Uh, high frequency, very high frequency that we use on a regular basis and are very well versed in, uh, and then down to more rudimentary communication methods uh, as, we, uh, as those get contested as well. Um, but the real one that I think we're going to rely on, especially on those forward operating bases that we build, uh, is what uh, uh, both a couple of the folks up here have already talked about, uh, and that is operating distributed in a distributed environment. Uh, and making going back to that uh, commander's intent, make, making sure that the people on the ground uh, have a good understanding of uh, those of the commander's intent. Uh, so when they are building and defending that forward operating base uh, and making it completely independent when it needs to be, uh, but then linking back uh, in a uh, connected environment uh, once that gets reestablished. So uh, it is that uh, a very thin line of uh, comms that can be easily disrupted for us. Uh, and I think that focus on decentralized operations, especially as we train and fight, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, those are going to be some of those challenges. Thank you, Admiral. Before we leave the, uh, the tactical uh, topic area of this first question, uh, I'd like to pose one other follow-up to each of you. Uh, I, I have three young daughters. They're in their early 20s. And if I took their iPhones away and I said, you know, navigate from point A to point B, uh, one of the three of them could probably do it really pretty well. Uh, they would all be a little bit uh, taken aback. My question is, as you look at the young soldiers, the sailors and airmen and Marines that you work with here that have grown up in, this, in their whole time in the military of, 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 for combat operations, if they've gone to the AOR having a certain expectation for, say, GPS or Blue Force trackers or communications back to the talk or back to the AOC, what is, what is your take on the the, the mentality and the, and, the, and the flexibility of those young warriors that have grown up in a different age than, than all of us grew up in. You know, how, what, do you, what do you think about just the, the culture that they've come up in and their ability to adapt to this different environment? Rob, you're looking at me, so uh, Jim's not. So go, ahead. go ahead, you go first. General, the first question I'd have to come back with you with, uh, or come back at you with is, uh, who's gonna make the maps for them to read? 
Uh, we have gone away from stockpiling maps. That's a, they're all electronic files. We've got issues as far as whether or not we'd be able to even get maps to teach them on how to use. But uh, I think your point is a, a very valid one. The, uh, certainly in the aviation world, the skill of navigating by map uh, is impacted by so many things, not the least of which is the ease to use a GPS. While these are solvable problems, that is not as easy as one would think, because to teach someone to navigate uh, in the air using map, clock map ground, you must actually put someone in the air to navigate clock map ground. To put someone in the air to learn how to do that, you're going to need flying hours. And flying hours right now are almost worth their weight in gold based off of what you can and cannot do in the air and what all of the multiple training events. So those map reading skills from an aviation perspective are significant. One, having the tools to read off of. Two, having the skill set to do so. And then three, the opportunity to do so depending on where you fly because losing airspace and the ability to free navigate in the United States is also an issue. Jim? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, it's obviously a concern and, and something we need to work on. There, Over the last 10 to 12 years of fighting, we've obviously moved to a uh, irregular warfare coin stability operation type fight and some of the fundamental skills that we were very proficient at prior to 911, we need to reinvest time and energy and, and training in. And I don't mean to make light of the problem. It, it, it is a problem for us. Uh, land nav without GPS, uh, some of our weapon systems uh, are overly reliant on, on GPS positioning to fire. So it is a problem. But in a little more optimistic view, maybe, uh, if you look at the problems that the young men and women serving in the armed services have been confronted with, and rapidly solved on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan. Just stop and think about some of the things. We went to war, encountered stuff we had never seen, tribal dynamics, IEDs, and I can go on and on. And the ability of young men and women, junior officers, mid-range non-commissioned officers, their ability to identify a problem, understand it, learn from the bottom and laterally, uh, think critically and solve those problems gives me a lot of optimism that once we finish up the fight in Afghanistan, recalibrate our training and leader development programs for what we see the future to be, I think this generation of young men and women will learn faster than we ever thought imaginable, and they're going to they're gonna figure it out. So I am optimistic about it. Over. Thanks, Jim. Mark? Sir, I'll tell you, I, uh, I share the same experience you do. I have three kids, and all of them are what I call digital natives. They grew up in this uh, in a digital environment. Uh, and one of the things, and uh, uh, General, I share your optimism with, the, with, uh, with them today, because what I've also found is they're extremely good at multitasking, uh, and they're also very good at dynamically moving from one form of communication to another form of communica communication. Now, I watched my kids start with a, with a, uh, a classic cell phone texting, uh, we had to push a button two or three times, and they could do that faster than I could type. Uh, and then I've watched them trans uh, transition through various different forms of communication. And, uh, granted, most of them all digital, uh, but they will carry on three, four conversations in three or four different medias, it be, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, uh, IM chats, and uh, probably three or four things they haven't taught me yet. Uh, I am very uh, encouraged by this. What I find in the young uh, sailors that are out there in the expeditionary forces is that there's a balance of understanding uh, that digital environment and being very comfortable in it, uh, but then also there's a, just a grassroots of uh, they still have to learn land navigation uh, once they uh, join our forces, and they take great pride in it. Uh, a lot of our forces come with a very grassroots uh, uh, part of America that comes to a, uh, you know, working with your hands and being very comfortable in the uh, working outside. And so they bring that to the fight as well. And I think the combination of their uh, flexibility in the digital environment, their ability to adapt, is going to be very good for our future. Thanks. Uh, I have a, my, I'm going to throw my two cents in on this topic because I talked about my daughters. I'll probably get in trouble for that. Uh, but I think I agree with what you said about the, the flexibility of our youth. Um, I, 
we've mentioned, someone mentioned in one of their answers A2AD, and sometimes when we talk about this type of a threat, uh, we think of near-peer competitors, maybe a country like China or somebody that has that capacity to, to threaten us in this manner. We've been talking a lot about GPS jamming. Uh, there's other sorts of electronic warfare devices out there that are not limited to just our near-peer competitors. The proliferation of this type of uh, threat is, is all over the world. Um, any country we may go to war with in a major combat ops way may in some way, shape, or form try to degrade what, how we, the things that we, these tools that we've come to rely on for war fighting. GPS is just one of them. I don't think we're going to be denied GPS from takeoff to landing. I don't think the Constellation will be taken out. I think it may be more local to a target area. And so when that pilot shows up and the cursors are not exactly superimposed over the, the desired mean point of impact like he or she's used to, and he actually has to use some other sensors to get the cursors onto the target, I don't want them to be surprised at that. If they, I don't want them to be surprised if there's some element of their Blue Force tracker or if there's something that's not working right, can they still fight their way through it? A lot of what we've been talking about here, when we change from a, the environment we've been in for the last decade to, a, to a, a differently contested environment, a lot of this is just raising the awareness level at the tactical level that this threat is out there, that what's on my radar screen, what's on my computer screen may actually not be true. And what do I do about it? And do I expect that? If it doesn't look right, do I verify it? And then what do I do about it? And I, I agree that I think our young soldiers, sailors, and airmen and Marines have shown great adaptability but it's, I think it's among uh, responsible to the leadership in our respective services to make sure we set the training venues up that highlight this threat and then watch them react and watch them adapt. But if you don't ever set that up and they stay comfortable expecting this technology, that's where we get into trouble. That's where that fog and friction gets very, very thick and the gears slow down. Okay, I said we weren't going to stay too long at the tactical level and I've probably been the <laughs> guilty of staying too long. I'd like to shift to the operational level and focus on command and control. When we're trying to take this force, uh, each of your forces, and execute your mission and do the command and control to execute that in this contested environment, it's going to affect each of you differently. Several times you've mentioned here this morning, and Admiral Gortney mentioned it in his opening remarks, uh, that the term mission command, commander's intent, mission type orders, and that means it's basically the same thing, but it means different things to different services as have, have we've grown up and how we've trained in the joint arena. So I'd like you to focus uh, this answer on how this contested environment, how you do operational uh, level of command and control in this contested environment. And uh, let's start at the very end, please. Uh, Thank Dave, you, sir. You're up first. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, historically, a strength of the Naval Service, the Naval Forces, has been the ability to operate independently of land-based communications, uh, as by necessity, but also uh, because we could. Um, centralized command and control and decentralized execution have always been a strength and a norm for naval forces. Over the 20, last 20 years or so, we have institutionalized exactly the opposite uh, processes. Uh, reliance on satellites and complex C2 uh, processes and networks to communicate and to task uh, and to coordinate have been the norm because we could, uh, but certainly not because we needed to. Um, I noticed walking in the, uh, the audience today uh, was a, a giant of war, naval warfighting, um, space and C5I development, and, uh, and a pioneer in, in training to those uh, in synergy in those two areas. Again, naval warfighting and, and C5I over the last 25 years have progressed uh, to an incredible degree. I'm referring to Admiral Mackey sitting over to, to my right and, and your left. Um, I was, had the great good fortune to be a young lieutenant uh, and watch him lead our, our carrier, uh, our cargo force staff in, in, training our, in uh, training our strike groups in how to better utilize emerging technologies. Uh, he was at the forefront of that. Uh, fast forward to 20 or a couple decades later, however, because of the benign environment uh, or C2 access we've, we've enjoyed, I think we've perhaps uh, relied perhaps too much on that centralized control, too much on those assured communications. So at the operational level, our focus must be uh, developing and training, developing tactics, techniques and procedures and processes, uh, anticipating the loss of, of uh, broad satellite access and developing those, those localized networks, those local, localized communications procedures, perhaps with uh, laser comms and relay uh, airplanes and aircraft, uh, to ensure that at the local 
an operational level, the theater level, we can continue to carry the fight, uh, perhaps without the access to the, the broader uh, national uh, command and control networks that we've come to rely on. So that's my, uh, my thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay. Let's just, we'll just work on down the line. And when I, I'll tell you my follow-up question right now. I'm going I'm to ask you to come back. And, and kind of analyze, give a self-critique of your services, kind of your doctrine, and some of your exercises and, and uh, war games that you do at the operational level, and how much today they're incorporating this type of things that we're talking about. But you can be thinking about that as we're working our way down. Jim? Uh, thank you, sir. Okay, so at the operational level, uh, a couple, and I, you know, I'll, I'll try and limit this, a couple things come to mind. The first is operational lines of communication. So in terms of impacts on the way we, we command and control or do mission command and we fight, uh, I think we would be well served to think about operational lines of communication. I would offer, uh, not just because I'm sitting here with them, that uh, it is indisputed that our country's military has the ability to open and maintain lines of communication at will in both the air and sea domains. I, I, I take that for granted as part of the land force. I think our citizens do also. So, But now ask yourself, is that true in space and is that true in cyber? And if it is true, is it true to the same certainty that the Navy and the Air, and the Air Force do that for us? So that's something we need to think about because we've got to be able to do that. It's as important. The reason it's important is because of operational logistics, and I know I'm, I'm not in the wrong seminar here. I know we're talking about command and control, but the reason I, I would offer another analogy to you is uh, we need to start thinking about the network as a weapon system. So whether you land war net, the gig, the joint information environment, we need to think about that as commanders a, a, as a weapon system. And if it's a weapon system, then bandwidth is a class of dis class of supply that enables that weapon system. We need to deliver that to commanders and units in the field. And, uh, and, and to do that, we have to have those lines of communication open. We have to dedicate combat power to it. We have to fight for them. We have to maintain them and, and be able to deliver that. So if you, if you kind of agree with me or at least open to the idea that we're, there, there's analogies with lines of communication and operational logistics, we need to come up with material solutions that produce a single, secure, and defendable network. One, just one single one. We can't have one for admin in CONUS. We can't have a training one. We can't have one we fight with. We need a single, secure network that is absolutely, it, we're gonna, the enemy's gonna be able to attrit it, knock it down temporarily, but they'll never, they can never take it away from us. So materially, we need to develop leaders that are agile and adaptive enough to use that and operate in that environment. I talked about that a little bit. And then I, I would echo my colleague from the Air Force's point there. We got to pay for it. You know, if we, if we want it, you got to invest in training and we got to be willing to spend the money that it takes to train the way you fight. We can't, we can't send soldiers, men, men and women into combat with systems they, they didn't see or couldn't use because of DISA or some other policy procedure prohibits a, the, our ability to train at home station. And those are tough policy things that I don't pretend to understand. But uh, I, I think those kind of thoughts and thinking uh, will serve us well as we look at the challenges operational at the operational level. Thank you. Mark? One of the concepts that we've been looking at very closely on the doctrine side is before doctrine comes your concept of operations. And we know that uh, in the future, uh, that preventing wars is going to be in, as important as winning wars. Uh, but also, uh, as we look at our phase zero operations, we know that the preparation that we do in phase zero really uh, sets the uh, groundwork, is the shaping operations uh, as you go through phase two. Uh, and so if you look at the concept of operations for the expeditionary forces, uh, we look at building adaptive force packages which pull all of our expeditionary capabilities together uh, and organize them so they can operate. And if you take for an example uh, with the shift to the Pacific in the South China Seas, uh, we're now regularly operating uh, in Cambodia, in the Philippines, um, uh, in Malaysia, all throughout the South China Seas at various locations. Uh, one from familiarity, uh, the other one is to build those uh, partner nation relationships that we know we're gonna rely on in phase two so that when we get into that contested environment, 
uh, that we have other means to, by which to uh, support our forces. Uh, and I would echo goes back to that combat logistics. How do you support that? You're going to need to rely on some of those uh, other uh, partners that you have out there. Uh, so a very, very big fo focus for the expeditionary forces in the Navy uh, is in that phase zero operations, and uh, they bring great capability for that one. Uh, we touched on it again, but also goes in that phase zero operations. We're going to do that in distributed operations. Uh, centralized command and control, decentralized execution with good commander's intent. Uh, and if you look at our operations, again, in the Pacific today, uh, we may have an adaptive force package that's working in four or five different locations throughout the, uh, the Philippines and uh, uh, in Malaysia today. Uh, and then the, finally, the one I'll talk about, kind of link back to I said, as we go ashore uh, and we build facilities uh, and we build those expeditionary bases, uh, one of the key, critical items for us is going to be uh, energy. Uh, and I'll go back to the experience that I had uh, in 2004 in Fallujah, Iraq, uh, and those lines of communication did get contested, and we started to uh, see the fuel lines get, uh, the fuel uh, line of communication get, get severed. Uh, and we got to a point where we started to get, uh, reach critical uh, levels of fuel. Uh, and I also look at that base as we had built it. Uh, we probably built it with the, the most uh, effective base we could, but it was far from efficient. Uh, and if you take the Marines of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force in Fallujah, Iraq in 2004, and you fast forward today to Afghanistan, uh, and you look at the uh, Expeditionary Forward Operation Base uh, concepts that they're doing um, uh, with the Marines out there, where they're using uh, solar panels, uh, they're using biofuels, they're using a number of different things. Uh, their expeditionary energy footprint is much smaller. And I think that's going to be a critical enabler for, in that contested environment uh, because we may be so distributed that we can't necessarily get fuel uh, and other supplies to it, so we have to be more self-reliant. Well, just before you go, Rob, the one feature of a contested environment that we haven't touched on, we've been talking a lot about the non-kinetic side, and probably uh, uh, for you, Mark, more than others, the, the actual kinetic side of the, the impact of long range and accurate and multiple tactical ballistic missiles on an expeditionary basing. And we, didn't, we don't experience that in our current conflict. We might experience that you know, elsewhere around the world. I mean, from it, are, are we, I don't want to get into the actual, def, you know, the, the, all the different defense networks, but from just from a, a uh, operational perspective, you know, knowing that your logistic spaces may be at risk kinetically from you know, large stockpiles of POL, how, how might that change when a a very accurate TBM comes in, that could really change the equation. I'd offer that we also need to make sure that we uh, maintain the, uh, the sea basing concept that we've had in the past that has been very effective for us. Uh, if you look at uh, when General Mattis uh, flew into Afghanistan uh, in the early phases of OEF, uh, he did it from a sea base and was able to logistically go forward. It did require those expeditionary support. We actually you know, uh, had to build and sustain uh, runway operations uh, to continue that, uh, really the air bridge from the sea to the shore uh, in order to do that. Uh, but that just shows you how critical that those redundant systems that we have within the military. And I think as we, and we'll, we'll touch into this a little bit, I think as we get to the end of the panel on sequestration and other impacts, I think that single line of failure is going, to be, uh, is going to be one of those areas that we're going to have to have a strategic discussion about uh, because as we go and say, hey, we can maybe perhaps do without that capability, we lose that redundancy that we rely on in combat. Thanks. Rob. That uh, the airline of communication has been, is given as a granted, um, I think is one of the key points that we probably need to address on the operational level because the airline of communication will not be a given in any uh, future high-intensity conflict. Uh, adversaries are aware of our capabilities, both airspace, cyberspace, and through the maritime domain, and certainly they will take great measures to kinetically contest that environment. Um, and that means a lot, that is going to mean a lot of things to us. You know, right now when we're command and controlling air power, certainly at the CAOC at al Udeed in Qatar, we will take assets in a global environment and bring them together at a certain place at a certain time with ease. We cannot count on that in the future. And what the Air Force will have to look at, uh, and what airmen in general, or those who apply air power from any of the services, will have to look at, are ways to be able to operate without that level of operational command and control. And certainly for us, that's going to mean 
kind of shying away from where we have gone over the past 20 years, where we've taken decentralized command and control, or centralized command and control, decentralized execution, and turned that into, in a lot of cases, centralized command and control and centralized execution. We will have to be able to fight dispersed, um, and we will have to be able to fight in a distributed manner that somehow are still able to bring those elements together that are necessary for a successful air campaign to maintain an airline of communication and access into enemy territory and deny them access into ours. But we have to be able to do that at the operational level that does it without a chaos being able to transmit the orders that it normally does. And that's going to be a huge challenge for us as we try and think our way through that problem because we will not be able to spend our way through that problem. I, I, I agree that from the Air Force perspective that's going to be one of our biggest challenges a little bit against some of people's recent culture, not in our history of our Air Force, but we've done it before, but we have to know how to do it again. Along those lines, uh, examples, if you have them, of uh, either at the operational level, exercises where we've, we've stressed this. You've been in a joint exercise recently where we talked about this. Let's just, we'll go backwards down the line of this exercise and training. How do we, at the operational level, how do we get our joint warfighters to think differently about command and control in this contested environment? What, this is the so what, what do we do about it? On a, uh, on a joint level, a couple of uh, um, incidents come to mind that I think are applicable. First, uh, the real world uh, issues of working in the, uh, uh, for defense of the Arabian Gulf or Persian Gulf, depending on which side of that body of water you live on. Um, as we discuss the ability to defend maritime assets and work closely with the maritime forces, uh, the ability to close control those air, air forces, whether they be uh, from sea-based platforms or land-based platforms, is going to be significant. And we're going to have to rely on a more form of procedural control than a type of positive control that we've done in the past. Things that we have done in the past, we have fought entire air wars uh, somewhere between 1941 and 1945 without the level of control that we have today. We can do that. We just have to think our way through those types of problems. Working with our land partners, though, uh, the ability to provide close air support in the manner in which it's given today will become a greater challenge. And depending on the intensity of the combat and the nature of the combat, we're going to have to see a, more of a shift to using air at an operational level beyond where, the friendly, where it's a conflict with friendly forces. As we saw last year during uh, Army uh, Third Corps' uh, warfighter in... Uh, um, Fort Hood, Texas, where we decided that we needed to give a commander's intent from the Joint Force Commander and the Land Component Commander on what he needed air power to do, and then allow air power to go do that without being able to close control it, uh, to take away the enemy's ability to uh, deny our command and control. So while these things can still be effective, they're going to change uh, the way in which we do business today, which is so tightly, closely controlled, where infantry platoons in Afghanistan have aircraft almost orbiting over top of them for their response. And I think in a contested environment, that's going to really have an impact on the way in which we employ. Thanks, Rob. Mark? You know, I'd offer in the uh, areas of exercises and uh, kind of the self-critique side, I think there's some things that we do very well, uh, and that's really the uh, organic training that we do for our forces in, uh, in isolation. I think we've got that very well uh, tuned. Uh, what we don't do very well, uh, we reach out a little bit with the joint uh, in our exercises, but what we don't really uh, fully grasp is the coalition piece. Uh, and I'll say that uh, if you look in the Pacific and working in... Uh, the exercises that we have uh, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, we do do a fairly good job with uh, uh, pulling together the coalition for that one. Uh, but as we look at across the full spectrum, uh, we very rarely get that opportunity to provide that full C2 uh, training that we get, uh, and we very rarely do it in the contested environment uh, from that perspective. So uh, I think that's fertile ground for us to, uh, to work on. Um, I will offer that uh, just the operations that we've had for the last 10 years have shown us how, uh, how challenging it is in a coalition environment because of the cultural aspects and the human factors that are involved. And I think that's something that we don't really train our forces in. Thank you. It, just real quick, a couple things. Uh, one thing we're doing well in the Army uh, recently is, is the idea of uh, opposing force. So 
uh, we have developed a cyber op four capability because up till a couple years ago we couldn't even train ourselves because we didn't have an enemy to replicate the cyber aspect. So that's a good news story. Uh, we still have a ways to go. I think everybody in the joint community would agree that our ability to simulate a realistic uh, contested cyber environment, um, especially the offensive aspects of it, so the, the, so we can, as we do training and exercises, that we have a real, realistic uh, enemy force and the capabilities for our, our uh, service members to operate the way they would on the battlefield in a home station uh, training exercise environment. And then the last one that's kind of the, the next big idea, I think, is uh, the idea of simulators, uh, for com not just for, for soldiers that operate on the network, but for commanders. We talk a lot about what commanders in the future are gonna have to be able to do. Uh, we can sim, I'm sure the other services can simulate like we can, tanks, Bradleys, helicopters. What we don't have is, is a uh, cost-effective, realistic simulation tool to train commanders given the, the realities of our future fiscal uh, constraints and realities. Before, before you go, uh, I want to touch on the simulation topic. It's affected us. We use simulators a lot in the Air Force, but what, what I've come to find, I've been studying this topic, is this, this has been a special interest item for Air Combat Command for the last three years. Um, and when we look at the simulation, some our simulators, both at the tactical level and at the operational level and the virtual training, some of this that we're do talking about, they can replicate fairly well. Some of it they can't. And the reason why they can't is because we never told the contractors five or ten years ago when we were putting in the requirements that we needed the simulated, the virtual world, the synthetic world, to be able to s replicate what we're talking about today. And, and so you get into this circular problem here where this, the, it's hard to train in that environment because we never set the requirement back five years ago and the contractors are trying to provide what we asked for. And now we need to make sure we're asking for this next iteration and upgrade of simulators that we can do some of these things we're talking about. Can the simulator replicate different types of communication jamming or different types of or data link or different types of intrusion? A lot of this will raise the awareness level, not just at the tactical level, but at the operational level, that this is part of the fabric of the fight. And it's not the contractor's fault, it's because we didn't, we didn't ask for it. So now we're trying to take what we have and, and use it to get, to get at this training, but it's going to be an iterative process with industry. Yes, yes sir, and, and just to be clear, I'm not an advocate of replacing live <laughs> training with no, virtual I, and constructive, but, but I, I do believe that used effectively, it lets you, when you are going to spend big dollars and do large real events, it lets you enter that at a much higher level of proficiency, therefore optimizing your, your cost, uh, your very expensive training. And then it's also very helpful, at least in, in, in the Army, for sustaining. We've, we've shown where you can come out of a training event at a, at a readiness level and sustain that proficiency much longer using simulation, so I'm not one of the... No, uh, we're it, is a, to it is a balance for all of us, simulation. but I think we're le where all of us are leveraging the virtual, the live virtual and constructive differently than we did when we were, when we were young officers. Okay, before Admiral Thomas gives his last comments, I'm going to switch to, uh, after he gives his last comments, I'm going to switch to Q&A, so if you have a question you'd like to ask, you can start queuing up at the, uh, the microphones on either side. Admiral Thomas? Just real quick, because I think most of the major points have been made. Um, the original question was operational level doctrine and exercises, how have we changed or how do we anticipate perhaps changing to uh, accommodate the vulnerabilities that have been discussed here. Um, hardware is a good place to start. Um, is good enough and, and redundant and, and, and hardened uh, versus uh, really great but fragile? Uh, is that the right question to have? Um, you certainly want really, really great, the best technology, but if it's fragile, perhaps it's not as welcome as good enough, hardened, and redundant would be. Similarly, recognizing fragility in the way we've been operating in the past, assuming a future uh, worst case denied environment, uh, acknowledging that fragility and then rolling those vulnerabilities into the training, I think has been a, a major focus of effort uh, within the Navy for the last uh, several years. Uh, in our joint exercises, uh, our JTFXs, our final certification events that we uh, send our, our forces forward after accomplishing, uh, we do, and this rolls back to some of the, the navigation issues that were spoken to and the weaponeering challenges, uh, we fold those loss of comms, loss of uh, or denial of sa satellite access and those 
into our exercises. It's a nascent uh, effort at this point, but it's a growing, uh, a growing effort and one that I think uh, is, is producing demonstrable results. Uh, so I think we're moving forward in the right direction. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd like to take uh, questions from anyone, and we can go to the side microphones. And I did not plant any questions, so I appreciate it if you all line up. And I'll start with this gentleman right here. You need to oh, probably get a little closer. closer. There we go. Good morning, gentlemen. Travis Dollister, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, J2, Current Intelligence. My question is, how will this decentralization that you talked about of high-level operations pose a challenge to the ability of the Joint Force Commanders to deal with consequence management of or combating against weapons of mass destruction? And in regards to this, is the current training at all levels concerning any WMD missions at this point in need of some revision due to expected decentralization of effort? Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll hop in here real quickly. I think uh, not just for the countering weapons of mass destruction, but I think there's some things, some basic truths that we're going to have to realize. That our ability to do real-time control of specific things, like we do today with the elimination of weapons of mass destruction from a kinetic viewpoint, not to do with any of the elimination that our, our ground partners necessarily do, but we're going to have to send forth forces with orders that they've received from a commander and operate under that commander's intent with very specific guidelines of areas in which they're going to operate and then be able to act on their own recognizance to try and eliminate those strategic weapons that are going to have such a big impact on our ability to prosecute any type of regional war. Uh, and so that's going to roll into the training aspect because, you know, bottom line is I'm going to take an Air Force captain with a flight of four aircraft or as a bomber commander and I'm going to put him somewhere over enemy territory and I'm going to say if you see something that looks like this please destroy it because I might see it at the command post but I may not be able to get that information to them and that is going to be really incumbent upon me to train that captain to make sure he is operating in the way he needs to for whatever uh, uh, type of mission we're looking at him to do and weapons of mass destruction are going to be a huge piece of that because instead of thinking of them as we weapons of mass destruction, we need to start realizing that these weapons are strategic weapons. I mean, we've known this, right? But we need to start characterizing these weapons as strategic weapons that are used to design to keep the United States out of a regional conflict or make the pain too great for us to continue. And these will probably become the foremost targets that we have to look for in any type of regional conflict. But we're going to have to have a procedure in place to do that. Anyone else want to jump on that? The one. I would like to add one comment. Uh, what General Givens was uh, alluding to here about how our kind of our, our airmen have been conditioned because of the, the type of conflict we've been in, both at the operational level and the tactical level, we've had the ability to communicate and direct, and we, and we have communicated and directed very explicitly for the last 10 or 20 years because tactical mistakes have strategic consequences in the current fight that we're in. The other side of this coin is not just the military side, but there's a civilian, there's an execution side of it, where our, our civilian, our populace, our news agencies, our people have come to look at full motion video as almost expected from every corner of the battlefield. And, and, and I want to see live, you know, whatever you're doing. And that's in a contested environment, particularly in an electromagnetic spectrum contested environment, that's not going to be possible. And, and it, is, it is a little bit step back to the past. But it is, it will, we will be operating perhaps under different ROE, perhaps under different restraints for collateral damage. And, you know, highly contested war is very ugly and it's very messy. And we haven't had that ugliness or messiness for a long time and it hasn't been on the, the Internet, you know, in the, in the evening for a while. I mean, it's, you know, snippets of the irregular warfare coin have been on, but not full-scale major combat operations. And so when we're talking about going after targets of weapons of mass destruction, whatever they may be, there's going to be a change in how we operate tactically and operationally in a contested environment. There's also going to be a change in the way it's, it's uh, perceived by our leadership and the expectations of our leadership on our military. Thank you. Yes, sir. First, I want to thank, thank Dave for his comments uh, and, and complimenting on his memory because I'm not sure I can remember back that far. One of, one of my basic warfighting tenets was I would never absorb the first hit. In three of the four warfare domains, we had rules of engagement, we had intelligence, 
we have situational awareness that would really allow us to be able to predict what was going to happen and take out the enemy's ability before the enemy hit us. We don't have that in the cyber warfare domain, to the best of my knowledge. We don't have the ROE. I think we have some capability. Uh, and I'm not sure we have all the right intelligence and the situational awareness. Uh, I think what I would want to do, what, what I, in a perfect world, if, if I could know that something was going to happen, I would want to take out the enemy's cyber capability to attack me, hit his servers, hit whatever is required, but I'd want to hit him before he hit me, which would help solve a lot of this problem of how bad are, is it going to be when we start the war. Well, I, we, I think there will be another panel later on on cyber uh, that will may get at some of those issues, sir. We've approached this, you know, how we do command and control in a contested environment um, from, a, from a singular dimension. In other words, what might a potential adversary do to us? decrease our situation awareness, decrease our ability to find targets, decrease our ability to, uh, to execute our mission. Please be rest, rest assured that today's, your military of today will be trying to do the, exactly the same thing to a potential adversary and to deny and degrade their situation awareness, their ability to communicate, their, their ability to prosecute targets on our side. And it will be a, a, a dirty, messy, ugly uh, war from that perspective. But our, my position is, if we, if we expect that, and not, we're not surprised by it, and we train to it, we fight our way through it, we'll win just like we won when you were in command, sir. Anyone want to jump on that? I'll just, to, uh, to the Admiral's point, um, we deploy on a, in the Navy, we deploy on a rotational basis forward to whatever uh, fleet has asked for our services, and off we go. But it's, a, it's an axiom, it's true, we're deployed, every, every person in the Navy is deployed in the cyber world every minute from the moment they log onto their computer at the beginning of the day. Um, we don't have a mature rule of, rules of engagement set. We don't have uh, perhaps the, the rigor in command and control relationships and commander's intent in the cyber arena that we have developed over the past centuries in the kinetic world the tangible world, and, and that is something we need to focus on, are focused on, but it's just, again, at its nascent stages, but surely we must continue to, to move forward in that with focus. That, Amen. That is certainly an area that we're get, getting more attention, and it's the, the blending of the kinetic and non-kinetic, and how we do that appropriately, and then the authorities, particularly authorities for, the, for our country, the authorities to use that non-kinetic force is a, some, sometimes challenging and requires uh, exercising. Yes, sir. Not to put too fine a point on it, but earlier we talked about you lose the satellite, you lose the computer uh, access to where you are located, and you have to kick to paper charts. Do we even have the paper charts? And could our folks adapt quickly? I will tell you, uh, our greatest strength is our, is our, our people. Uh, and it's, sec or it's close second to that is our other greatest strength is our industry. And so I'm certain that our people will adapt very quickly to the circumstances presented tactically, and industry will fold on top of that and, and accommodate what we need uh, very, very quickly as well. Sir, thank you. Dr. Mitchum. Uh, you not hearing you. Hello? There you go. Okay. Dr. Mitchum, political advisor for our comeback command. Um, we have ample problems today sharing information, foreign disclosure, with trusted allies we work with all the time with all the high-tech toys we possibly could want. I'd be curious for any insights or lessons learned or observed in the coalition environment or the expeditionary environment dealing with non-traditional allies where we would expect to lose those common assets. How do you get the critical elements of the war plan or the expeditionary plan to the coalition partner? Yes, sir. Um, the good news is it's so hard to do using our technology that it wouldn't be that big a deal if we lost in the centuries. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. The, the answer to your question is the old-fashioned way. You, you, you exchange LNOs, uh, human beings is, is the most effective. Uh, it's matured some in theaters. We have forces in some places as we work our regional aligned forces concepts in the Army. We're working on new partnerships. 
uh, where we don't have similar systems and, and uh, physically extending your network, your system to your partners is, is the most effective way. So you keep the technology within your you know, uniform wearing folks and then share information within the rules of engagement and disclosure. Um, one, one of the, the fundamental requirements for a commander, mission command in the Army at least, uh, is the idea of building teams. You have to be able to build teams internal to your formation, which we all know as military folks, that's kind of a no kidding, but the idea that one of the big things we've learned the last 10 or 12 years of fighting is you have to have the ability to build teams within the unified action partners or within the gym, you know, multinational, even the interagency. And candidly, you know, we're still not perfect at inner service stuff. Uh, we're learning from that. So uh, that the idea that building teams within unified action partners and, and extending extending your network is something that's a fundamental aspect of what we're trying to do with Mission Command. Thank you, sir. My name is Carl Osgood. I write for Executive Intelligence Review. One thing, I was at a discussion about a month ago at the Sea Air Space Conference in Washington on Air Sea Battle. None of you have actually mentioned Air Sea Battle, but there's a great deal of overlap between the general themes that you've been talking about and what I heard in that discussion, particularly the idea that in the future the maritime and air domains won't be, uh, won't be uncontested. You've also mentioned the cost of training, and I was somewhat astonished, taken aback by the mention that you don't stockpile paper charts anymore. Although I, I suppose I shouldn't be surprised by that, but I can still read a map, although I don't think my stepdaughter has ever seen one. Uh, but in, in this notion of you know, the, the this future that you're talking about in an era of austerity, budget austerity, is air sea battle giving you things that you need in order to uh, operate in this contested environment that you're talking about? Because uh, I'm, I'm curious as to why it, it, I mean, there's been a couple references to A2AD, but I'm curious as to why nobody said air sea battle. Well, I, uh, it's, it wasn't, it was not due to, there's, there's no, there has been no shift away from that. As a matter of fact, the Army has come aboard and figured out where, where, how they work into the air sea battle construct. There's a lot to the, this topic of air sea battle, but as it relates to fighting in a highly contested environment, I can tell you that for, we, this is not a, a, a new topic for the, uh, for the Air Force and the Navy. We've been working in this direction for the last several years. Uh, the, I can, the exercises that we've been doing just recently off the Atlantic coast uh, in the last year uh, and between out in the west coast between Nellis Air Force Base and Fallon uh, Naval Air Station out in the, in the west, and particularly in this environment, particularly in this uh, contested electromagnetic spectrum environment and the sharing of TTPs, the sharing of lessons learned, that has grown exponentially in the last couple, last couple years and will continue to, to do so. And we're not just keeping it between us and the, and the Navy. I think there's things that apply to our ground forces as well. Uh, so it, this is an ongoing uh, effort. There's a lot of this of the air sea battle effort that we can talk about in open press. There's a lot of it that we can't talk about that's classified. But the direction that we're going, we're not stepping away from it. We're moving forward in that direction, and and uh, it will enable us to fight not just in an A2AD environment. I mean, we mentioned this before because some people say A2AD, they think of a certain category of a country. They say, well, we'll never go to war with that country, and therefore, why should we worry about A2AD? I personally don't like the phrase A2AD. I don't try to use it except for when I'm forced to. I I prefer very very highly you know contested because it's just all different levels of of, of being a contested environment, and the Air Force, the Navy, and the Army are all looking to f figure out how we can command and control our forces better in that environment. Air Sea Battle is sailing and flying very smoothly in the, in the right vector, right direction. Okay. Last question, and then we'll all offer the panel some, uh, a minute or two for closing comments. Thank you. One of the common themes from all the speakers has been commander's intent. How can we in industry help you with information technology to make commander's intent better understood up and down the line of command? Hire some English majors. Uh, you know, I say that jokingly, but teaching commanders how to write and get their message across in the written form in something, you know, other than a standard uh, five paragraph field order to capture the complexities of rules of engagement and his intent are, are going to be significant. And industry, 
I think, can help in that regard by, while we come up with technical solutions, certainly making sure that the, for lack of a better term, I'm, I'm a, a victim of the, what I'm talking about, uh, provide us the English terms to be able to do that, and that will translate into other languages as well, too, because commander's intent in English translated into uh, Korean sometimes gets lost, and vice versa. And I think uh, helping us out with that would be great. Uh, I mean, I want to add on one thing on that on for, from an industry perspective. There's a, because of what we've been in, the type of war we've been in for the last uh, uh, couple, t decade or so, there's sometimes an expectation that at the very pointy end of the execution that that needs to be connected all the way perfectly back to some operations center. And what I'm suggesting is that if you, if you understand this commander's intent that we will be forced to operate and that those lines of connectivity may not be there, that having a depiction in your cockpit, a depiction in your, uh, your Humvee of, that would enable that forward edge of the uh, commander to make those decisions based on commander's intent, if that's a, dis a display mechanism, if that's text that comes in a certain way, but understanding that these decisions may be made more forward than completely cent centrally in the rear, just even that understanding, I think, will drive technology a different direction than what it's been for the last two decades. Okay, I'm getting the hook here from General Dubia. I'll, General, sir, I'll talk with you afterwards. You have thir 30 seconds, anything down the line, Admiral? Nope. I just, real quick, sir, uh, it, it's going to be hard. we got a lot of challenges facing the military coming up. These are tough problems. It's good that we're talking about it. We're still fighting a war, and as long as there's one, one uh, U.S. service member over there, that's got to be a priority. But we're going to have an opportunity over the next 10 years, you know, never waste a crisis, right? So we're, we're going to have some constraints fiscally. But the good news, if you're an optimist, is it's going to provide us the opportunity to invest in some really important stuff like developing leaders and, and work in our training. And I just remind everybody that, that thinking is free, you know, so it's all right to spend some of this uh, time and energy thinking about these hard problems. And I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to be here doing that with you. Great, great line. Admiral? Let, let me just offer, I think that the, if you look out to the future, I'd say that the future is very bright. Uh, these challenges that we face today are probably no different or no more formidable than the challenges that our predecessors did. Uh, and I'll go and echo Admiral Thomas's comment. The strength of all of our services is in our people and their ingenuity and their uh, ability to innovate. Uh, and if we just have to make sure as leaders we continue to uh, enable that. Thank you. General Gibbons. I'm going to take the pessimist view for a second because somebody needs to. Um, I agree with the ability of us to adapt, but the question is, is can we accept 10,000 casualties on the first day of the next war, or can we do things now to lower that to 1,000? And that's what we have to do. In this room are people who have solved some of these problems in decades past. At this table are people who've dealt with these problems as junior officers that we have had other ways of dealing with in our reliance on the things that will be taken away from us by an enemy in the next conflict. It is incumbent upon us to make sure that we don't force our young, bright, adaptive military to relive lessons while under fire in another conflict. We have to learn that operational cohesion can be maintained in many ways and must be maintained because that will be the difference in the 21st century in high intensity conflict. If we can maintain our operational cohesion, self-awareness, adversary awareness, environment awareness, commander's intent awareness, and the ability to transmit that, and more importantly, can we take away an enemies, we will come out on top. But we have to make the decisions now. And as Churchill said, gentlemen, we're all out of money. It's time to think. It's time to think. And we have to train to those levels. I'll thank my distinguished panel. Oh, I'm if sorry. I can take my nickel back. Yep, so yep. I'll take a middle ground stance on both of those positions. One, our people are great, and they will always carry the day. Second, we've got some vulnerabilities. So to the earlier point about we've got to recognize cyber arena, cyber space as, as, as important to develop the command and control relationships and structure, as important to develop the ROE, and as important to really understand what commander's intent means in cyber warfare, I think that's, that's what our focus must be on. So, 
All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. You've been a, a perfect panel uh, to kick off this topic, incredibly important topic. I appreciate all the questions that have come from the audience. appreciate your attention. I didn't see anyone sleeping up here, which is really a good thing for this time in the morning. And uh, I want to thank you all very, very much uh, for this, uh, participating in this very, very important topic for our military and for our nation. Thank you.